years ago, Baltimore Clippers were considered the fastest ships on the water. When you're looking at the pride of Baltimore II, sailing past Fort McHenry and Baltimore Harbor. She's a modern reconstruction of Baltimore Clippers that were highly successful privateers in the War of 1812. Pride II was built in Baltimore in 1988 and has sailed over 200,000 miles visiting the Caribbean, Europe, and Asia as well as North America. Here's a shot taken out in the Chesapeake showing more speed with a bit more breeze. Over the years, Pride has participated in many tall ships races confirmed her historical reputation as a fast sailor which is what Baltimore Clippers were known for 200 years ago. I'm Pierre Hencart, historian of the Pride, and I've been privileged to sail on it on dozens of different occasions on various waters in different weather conditions. I'd like to show you what it's like to sail the Pride with video I shot in the summer of 2016 during the Tall Ship Festival in the Great Lakes. I joined the Pride in mid-August in Duluth, Minnesota, which is as far west as an ocean-going vessel can go. That location makes it an active shipping port for iron ore and grain, and like Baltimore, sailing ships are part of Duluth's history. I arrived during Duluth's Tall Ships Festival, with hundreds of thousands of visitors coming to the port to view and to sail on the tall ships you see here. The Pride's role was to take visitors out on 90-minute sails around the harbor, and four of those a day meant a lot of work for the crew. It's impressive to see how nicely the Pride sails only three sails up in these gentle conditions, but it provides passengers with a meaningful reenactment of transportation 200 years ago. But on Monday morning, it was time to get ready for the final tall ships race of the season as the Pride turned eastward for the start of its return to Baltimore. This race day started off like most days with our morning shipboard routines. Here's Captain Jan Miles directing our departure from our berth in Duluth. Out on the lake we found very little wind, raising fears that the race would be postponed or canceled. But tall ship captains today study the weather forecast and we could see our competition on the Brig Niagara getting ready to set sail. Team the bird was... Alright, let's set the four! First mate Chad Lossing has the crew setting that big three-footed foresail. Raising Pride's monster mainsail is never easy. Setting Pride's square for a topsail requires quite a lift. And then bracing the foretop yards is another workout. You gotta take care while passing that foresail from one tack to another. Yeah. 
By the time we got seven sails up, we had a gentle breeze from the southwest, and we were ready to believe the forecast increased for good racing condition as we headed east. In any race, you want to get a good start, and Captain Miles has done this many times. We crossed the starting line as our square Tagalog was going up. There's our competition out there, the three-masted schooner Dennis Sullivan and the brig Niagara. Here's our competition, the when and if, a beautiful 63-foot schooner built as a yacht during World War II for General George Patton. She got a jump on us at the start, but it wasn't too long before we pulled up to her. It looked like we were doing okay with eight sails set but the stunsel gives us some extra power in the broad reaching conditions we were seeing. Captain Miles mustered the crew for a strategy discussion at this stage. Then the stunsel went up. So here we are in mid-morning, broad reaching with about 10 or 12 knots of wind, and all those sails powering the boat along beautifully. During the afternoon, our southwest wind picked up a bit, and here we are rolling along very comfortably, making about nine knots. 
As the Pride's historian, I couldn't help thinking about those Baltimore Clippers in the Southeast trades coming back from China 200 years ago. I had the 4-8 to eight watch, so I got to head below before sunset. I could hear the next watch taking in the stun solings in anticipation of stronger winds. But after that it got quiet, and for me sleep came easily as I lay down with my head only inches away from water rushing by at 10 knots. But then there's a knock at the door at 3.45 a.m and it's up on deck by four. You can't see much in the darkness, but it was clear that our southwest wind had held up nicely. That 10.4 knots is our speed over ground, and the word is we even slowed down some in the last hour or so. The sun rose about 6.15 with the wind diminishing a bit, but our speed was still pretty good as we were getting close to our finish line off the tip of the Kiwino Peninsula. None of our race competition was anywhere to be seen. We finished the race at 7 o'clock, still going over 8 knots. There was nobody out there to see us, and since we were able to see the shoreline, it was solid trees. We called in our finish by radio. So as Pride's historian, I think this race shows how Baltimore Clippers like the Chasseur could set speed records 200 years ago in much longer passages like this one to China. They bragged about their 200 mile days, mostly in the trade winds. We had similar winds and logged similar speeds over nearly a day. After we finished the race, we rounded the tip of the Kawina Peninsula and had to head up to nearly a beat to get us into our next port, Marquette, Michigan. The wind was holding up pretty well, so sails started coming down, starting with the Tagallant and then the Jibs Hobson. sailing nicely for three or four hours, but then the wind died down and came around to dead ahead. It was time to turn on the diesels to get us into a quiet berth in Marquette before dark. It was nice to have that option that wasn't available 200 years ago. The next day was Wednesday, declared a maintenance day, and we started to prepare the ship for Marquette's smaller tall ship festival.
local fishermen in Marquette gave us a nice batch of lake trout, and our cook Phil responded with a fine dinner. Everybody on board was happy with Pride's race performance, but we hadn't officially heard the outcome of the race. We were pretty sure we won, even with the handicap time we had to give other tall ships in the race. By the end of the week, it was time for me to head home, and I drove back to Duluth through Michigan's thinly populated woodsy Upper Peninsula, where scenery hasn't changed much in 200 years. I realized how lucky I was to have been aboard Pride for those ideal sailing conditions during the race. Pride really was reenacting the 1816 trade wind days when Chasseur was sailing like we did for a solid week. Although not a formal race, Chasseur's 94-day, 14,000-mile passage from Canton to the Virginia Capes set a speed record that held for 16 years. Fair winds and following seas is a standard sailor's departure wish, and we were lucky to have that for Race 5 in Lake Superior. But I was also lucky to be on board the best ship with the best crew.